when we think about leadership, especially among the people of God, uh, those are two qualities that we need to see in our leaders, that we're bold and righteous. Just being bold leaders is not enough because uncontrolled boldness can violate people's rights. You've seen people who, have, who are not so much righteous, <laughs> but they're bold. They'll say whatever comes to mind and they'll say it with no, no refrain and they don't care if they hurt your feelings. They don't, it, it's you that's got to get over it when their lives is as raggedy as anyone else's. Um, that kind of boldness, the word where we don't care about the feelings and we don't care about the, the growth of others. Uh, that's not the kind of boldness the church needs. Uh, not any boldness that's going to violate the rights of people. Being just righteous is not enough. Because to be righteous without initiative or even the courage to follow through with what you know is right. What good is that? And out of a leader, it really serves no real purpose for the people of God. Uh, so while boldness is needed in leaders, their boldness must be controlled by righteousness. A leader must know what is right and what is the right thing to do. There is a difference there. Most people know right from wrong. But everyone doesn't do the right thing. Having a right to do something is very different than doing the right thing. So I may have a right to do a lot of things, but it may not be the right thing to do. And having this kind of righteousness along with boldness, you find that those leaders, they possess these qualities in the, where they're not only knowing what's right, but they're doing what's right. Um, Leaders should be able to act decisively and boldly to carry out any righteous act. But there is also a need for leaders to seek the will of God. When we say seeking the will of God, it's recognizing what God is doing and joining God right where he's at with what he's doing. When we do that, what we find is that God may take us on a, on a path that we had no idea that he's on, you know. There, people can be so obedient, disobedient that God is there working in their lives and they don't even realize it. Somebody who's obedient to the will of God will come, join God in what he's doing, and you start to see shifts and changes and turns take place to where God's will becomes evident when you see what's going on. Uh, what true visionary leadership is, is not seeing something in your, with what we call a spiritual eye and moving toward that. Visionary leadership is being able to, to notice what God's doing around us and joining in with God. Having enough of vision to know that, that whatever it is God's doing, that's where I need to be. And I'm going to follow God. Um, most people want to, they, most people want a cause in which they commit themselves to. If I can be committed to something, then it'll make sense. And, and I'm able to move toward a goal, a task, a purpose, and that will satisfy folks. But visionary leadership, these leaders are desperately needed. They're leaders who who are able to lead us better. Now this may come at a great sacrifice, but to join God in what he's doing, the sacrifice is always wor um, worth it. Jesus tells us in Luke 9, 23 and 25, as he said to all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, follow after me for whatever, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it for what." Profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. So really, if whatever we're doing, whatever sacrifice it, it may be toward for us, if it gives God glory, the sacrifice is worthy. 
is worthy. Uh, Nehemiah was such a man. He was a true leader. He was both bold and he was righteous. He was a leader who exhorted and challenged others to action. Now we remember Nehemiah was a cupbearer in King Ar Artaxerxes. He's the cupbearer in his, in his kingdom. Um, while in the palace, uh, Nehemiah received news. And we, we got this last week. A week before last, he received news that there was trouble in Jerusalem, that the exiles had returned to, they returned to other gods. They were doing ungodly things. They were being persecuted. They were, they were being um, ridiculed by those who were outside. The walls of Jerusalem were torn down. The gates were, had been burned up. So they had no way of defending themselves. And when he hears this news, he's broken. He tears his clothes. He begins to weep. He begins to fast and pray about this. And during the days, uh, he sought the Lord to give the king uh, or to give him an opportunity to approach the king so that he could go help the people himself. Now, here... Seeking a long leave of absence from the king could be very dangerous. If the request displeased the king, then he could imprison Nehemiah. He could even have Nehemiah executed. Because this is a very serious request. So Nehemiah took actually four months to pray and seek God for the right strategy, the right time, and the right approach to the king. So as we begin looking tonight, we're going to look in these first eight verses, see how far we can get to these eight verses. At, at 7.30, somebody get my attention. I don't have my watch with me today. Uh, I was on my way here and didn't want to turn around when I realized it. Uh, Chapter 2, look at these first eight verses. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. So we can hear, it's like Nehemiah's narrating this. Uh, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I, might, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah and a letter to Asap, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. This is God's holy word. So now we find while serving the king, Nehemiah does something that is courageous, but it's also dangerous. Uh, am I? So I'm at the Uh, he does something. Yeah, it's 243, 344. 344, 
Uh, yeah, so while serving the king, Nehemiah does something very courageous and dangerous. One, well, he showed a bad countenance. He showed a bad countenance. So basically what Brother Lawton was saying earlier, people wearing these masks, you can tell they're not smiling. You can tell they're sad. They're frowning. They're upset. Well, he's, here he is before the king. And he's the cup bearer, and he's got a sad countenance. Uh, Nehemiah acted as if he's heartbroken. Now, what made this dangerous? Of course, he's a man. He's human, full of emotion, just like us. Him being before the king with a bad countenance, what would make that dangerous? Got to have a thought. If you look at it from my standpoint, okay. Game of the man. Yeah. He never seen your mind like this. Right. It's only what did you do? What did you know? <laughs> and then Nehemiah's just this question. Ask this question. I don't know if he would ask ask this question. But what makes it so dangerous to be for him to have a sad look on his face? You don't come to the king's head. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, you, you just didn't walk into the king's. Why would you think that a king would be paranoid? <laughs> he's the cupbearer. He's he's the man he's trusting more with his life than anyone else. And this man's coming into the, the king's presence with a sad look on his face. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Well, exactly. Here's the king sit in his position. And let's, let, let's set this straight. Let's, let's put this in our, our day. Um, if I've got a position that I've worked hard to get to, and I'm sitting in a position, and, I'm, and we've hired someone in a position lower than me, I know I've, that's got the same qualifications <laughs> or more, but they didn't know the people I knew. They didn't get the job, but because I knew the right people. I had better be paranoid enough to do my job well, hadn't I? If I know there's somebody behind me that is qualified to take my job. Well, let's, let's talk about what happens in this world. <laughs> there are people who die because others want where they're at. Now, we don't see that so much on the job site, legal jobs, but if you look at gangs, gang, every gang member has a duty, and every gang leader is paranoid because any time something is off, just the least little bit, they become paranoid. Somebody in that gang wants to be the head hotchet. Honcho, ain't that the way you say it? They want to be head of next. And so here's the king. The cupbearer's coming there, and he's got a sad countenance. Never seen him sad, but he's got a sad countenance today. Red flags start to jump up. What's going on? Man, have you poisoned me? Is someone else trying to poison me? Going, in, going before the king... There, should, there has to be nothing that's out of normal. There's nothing that, everything has to be as it should be. If you don't, then the king senses that there's something else going on. And the way you're coming is not worthy. 
and fitting for the king. Now, Brother Kit was on to something. Listen, we can't come before God any kind of way. If we come broken, he understands that. But we can't just come any kind of way. When we come before him, we have to come before him feeding for him being our king and our Lord. Here, Nehemiah was doing something very dangerous. He had this sad countenance. Now, he was relying on something. Uh, he was relying on the fact that maybe the Lord is working in the king's heart. He's been praying for four months. He's been fasting off and on within these four months. He's really been seeking God. And so when the king noticed this cupbearer's distress and countenance, his thoughts didn't turn to suspicion. Nehemiah had to be counting on God to work on him to where his thoughts wouldn't be that of suspicion. Instead of suspicion, his thoughts became sympathetic. He, uh, he, he began to, to inquire and wonder what's going on with Nehemiah. So the king asked him why he was so sad. He wasn't ill. He wasn't sick. Why was he sad? It, it wasn't making sense to the king. Maybe the king was thinking, Nehemiah, you, you, you've got it okay now. Your biggest duty is to protect me with what I eat, what I drink, making sure I'm not poisoned. Outside of that, you've got it made. You're probably the person I trust more than anyone else in the kingdom. So he becomes concerned at that time rather than suspicious. When we think about the kings and their kingdoms and we think about the possibility of others trying to dethrone them and the paranoia that is usually upon someone who gets in certain positions. Um, he had to think an awful lot of Nehemiah for him not to be suspicious. Or God had to do an, awful lot, an awfully big work in his heart. Um, as a matter of fact, the king, when he asked the question, he opened up the opportunity for Nehemiah to, to come to him with the question, to inquire what he really wanted to know. But Nehemiah become dreadfully afraid. The Bible says, King James says that I became very sore afraid. <laughs> so here he is standing before the king with a sad countenance. The king's opened up the opportunities, been gracious to him, and opened an opportunity for him to make his request known. And now he's afraid. Nehemiah knew that the king's order was partly why the, the city had not been built in Jerusalem. It's because of what the king had said in Ezra, I think it's chapter five, four, in Ezra four, the king had stopped the building of Jerusalem years before. The, the king had feared a Jewish rebellion if they were allowed to rebuild the city. If we look there in Ezra four, I can take you to those verses. If we look there, especially from verses six to verse 24. But if we look at, if we look there in verse 13, not 13, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 16. What had taken place is some of the leaders there had gotten in touch with the king, wrote this letter informing the king that, if he, that there could be a revolt that took place if he allowed the Jews to build the walls in Jerusalem and to put the gates up. They were trying to worship and they got that reestablished. Now they're wanting to reestablish their kingdom. Okay. They were accusing, they were um, bringing accusation. Look there in verse 13, it said, let it be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. So that, here's an accusation based upon nothing. 
really based upon nothing. There's nothing that the Jews had done to give them idea, an idea that this is what they would do. But they send this to the king. Also, in verse 16, it says, We informed the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you, you will have no dominion beyond the river. Of course, the king didn't want to hear that his kingdom has been lessened. He wants his kingdom to grow, not to retreat. So here in, in verse 19, the king sent an answer from verses 17 to verse 24. The king said, but go to verse 19, said, I gave the command and the search has been made. And it was found that the city in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and sedition has been fostered in it. If you jump to 21, it says, now give the command, make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. In verse 22, take heed now that you do not fall or fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the king? So obviously the king bought in to this accusation against the Jews. Chapter 4 in Ezra. And, and so when here Nehemiah is about to make a request. And the request is needed because of something the king had done years before. The king had stopped the building. And now Nehemiah is requesting, is about to make a request to go back. So Nehemiah showed a deep, well, let's look here. Uh, his heart was pounding rapidly. Nehemiah respectfully approached the king. So Nehemiah understands, okay, the king is partly responsible <laughs> for Jerusalem not being built. I'm wanting to ask, can I go and finish rebuilding Jerusalem? Um, so he, in his request, he begins this way. May the king live forever. One, by saying that, he's saying, king, uh, I pray that there's no threat to your life. And I pray that your kingdom last forever that's what he's saying to the king in making this comment so he's got his attention and with a sadness of heart he he asked the king look down in verse three why should my face be sad why should my face be sad face not be sad when the city the place of my father's tombs lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire so he shows a lot of respect here <laughs> um, for his ancestors. He shows here he's got a broken heart over the circumstances that surrounding his home city. He's mentioning two facts in the way that he did this. He hoped to arouse the king's sympathy. He wanted the king to feel sympathetic to the king's cupbearer because he was worried about not on the, his father's tombs. He was concerned about his ancestors. And he was concerned about his home. There's something to that among certain people. Certain groups of people. You go to try to dig on Indian burial ground. They'll fight you tooth and nail. Doesn't matter how much it's going to bring. How much... Whatever the digging, how much good it may do to the community, that's a sacred place. You don't disrupt burial grounds. Um, and here, he shows his respect for the dead, and he shows his respect for his home in hopes that the king would be sympathetic. So as, he's, as he does this, the king asks, well, what do you request? So in this statement, or this, this asking, why should my face not be sad? Or why should my countenance not be sad? He hear, the king hears that there's a request with this. He's got a plan together. The king hears this. So he's asking him, what, what is it that you request? What, what's on your mind? What do you want? 
Now, notice what Nehemiah, uh, just as Nehemiah had hoped the king's heart was moved and he had the king's attention. But notice what Nehemiah had done. Um, before answering the king, he prayed. He prayed before he answered the king. Now, we don't know if he stood there. We don't know if he backed away. We don't know if he turned his back. We don't know if he bowed down on his knees. We don't know if he had a, a two-minute prayer, a 20-minute prayer, or 20-second prayer, or a five-second prayer. I would think, Lord... I need your help. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have no idea. <laughs> uh, I mean, scripture doesn't lay that out for us. But what it does tell us is he took time to pray. And make sure, to make sure that he's telling God I'm depending on you to answer this man's question. Here's the king. His life now is in the king's hand. When the king asked him the question, what's your request? He knew that if it was a request the king didn't want to hear, he could be put to death. No questions asked. So he's put his life in that moment in the king's hand. So he's saying, God, I'm putting my life in your hands. So whatever, whatever is needed, God... That's what we'll do. So Nehemiah says, if it pleases the king and if your servant uh, is found, has found favor in your sight. Uh, Nehemiah, with this intro to his request, is acknowledging the king's authority. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight. He's reminding the king, I'm not overstepping who I am and who you are. I'm not challenging you. I am your servant. You are the king. And if it pleases you, if I've pleased you, king, um, this is the way he introduces this. So in order to make this bold petition, and it was, a, it was really a bold petition, Request. Now, he asked the, the royal commission, he asked the king to travel to Judah to rebuild his home city. What made this such a bold request? Well, he could have, but but the relationship between the okay the relationship between the peoples. Okay, so the controversy you would say could have made that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And he was going to the man that was the problem from the beginning. Right. Ask, could he go back to fix what the king had? Yeah, of course, you know. He had to be in charge of Okay, knowing that the king, knowing that the king was responsible for what Nehemiah was going to fix. That, take, that took boldness. But right here, what really made it bold comes along with what Gerald said. So you take these two and you put it together. One, he's asking, can I go fix your mess? And then the king's next question, how long are you going to be gone? <laughs> so here, it meant that the king was going to lose his most trusted servant. The one who put his life on the line. And Jer uh, Nehemiah is saying, I need to leave for a while. <laughs> who, else, who else does the king trust like that? Yeah. <laughs> who else does he trust? Those trusted men would be gone. He would be gone. I'd imagine that the appeal shocked the king. 
that's just I'm, I'm saying I imagine this. Uh, the th- just to think that he's losing his most trusted servant. It had to cross his mind as Nehemiah is asking. I'd imagine that the king was actually speechless for a few seconds. Nehemiah said, it, "Wait a minute! Did he just ask if he could leave me? Make leave, and he le- left the king vulnerable." Well, it could, you could be right. I mean, there's nothing that tells us it's not. And that's an interesting thought. Uh, I didn't hear any of that. I didn't read any of that in any of the, any of the uh, resources I was looking at. But it's an interesting thought. It really is that... It just flows. Mm-hmm. Well, here's what it does tell us. There was about four month span in between him getting news of what was going on and him talking to the king. So he had four months here to not only pray and seek God's direction, but also to plan. So I think Nehemiah had his plan together before he ever approached the king. And here's why I say that it's wise. It's wise to come before a group with not just a suggestion, but a plan if they like the suggestion. Because just coming up with a suggestion is, is not enough. It, I think that we are blessed in our area. And I'm talking about southeastern United States. I think we're blessed with visionaries no let me say this right we're blessed with dreamers we don't have many visionaries the difference is that in that is that some a dreamer can come up with this idea the visionary put puts a plan together to put it in action and here we find that nehemiah is a visionary leader He's somebody that not only has this dream or this idea, but it's, it's not his, it's God's. Because it was born out of sorrow for God's people. And then he took time to pray, seek God's face, and plan these four months. Now, whether there was, it was more than one meeting, we don't know. It could, it could very well be. But Nehemiah's plan... It was very strategic, and you see it in how he went about asking the questions. Uh, He comes in, this is the, and it may not have been Nehemiah's plan to come in that way, but he did. He comes in with a sad countenance. He's depending on God. He then, the king asked him, what's going on? Why are you so sad? Why shouldn't I be sad? My, My family, where my father's are buried they're in trouble okay what well now what do you want i want to go back and i want to help them everything everything there there in that conversation it would have to be almost fluid um, because it's like nehemiah is trusting god for the king's response He's depending solely upon him. And I think as leaders, regardless of what level of leadership is, when we are prepared for the response that others are going to give, then it, that forms the questions that we ask. Because we're prepared. That's how you, that's how you do away with conflict in meetings. If you're in a meeting with 12 of you, you need to know all 12 people. You need to know how they respond to certain things. You need to know some things about them and their character and their characteristics that they have and how they respond to certain things. So that when you come into the meeting, you're so prepared that 
that you know it's going to go over because you can answer the question that you know is coming. Have you ever been in any of those meetings? I've been in those meetings. I've been in meetings where I can, I know something was brought to the table and I could tell you who was going to ask this question. It was going to be asked. Sad part for me is oftentimes I'm not prepared <laughs> as well as I should be. Um, it, 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 you know, wouldn't that make y'all's meetings so much easier? <laughs> I can't imagine. You talk 21 people in a meeting. Yeah, at, at 21 people in a meeting. And if you knew, if the tribal chair knew how to set the room and understood the people that were there, and then he would know what questions to ask because he knew the response that would be coming from them. Here it appears that, Jer that Nehemiah has figured that out. It appears that way. Um, whether he had or not, I don't know. But, but look at what he asked for. He, he, if it pleases the king, uh, and I found favor, Nehemiah introduces it. He's bold with his petition, and he asked for this royal commission. But now, the Bible tells us that, yeah, the Bible tells us his petition is granted. Uh, when the king, when the queen, with the queen sitting by his side, the king questioned Nehemiah about how long he would be gone. Well, undoubtedly, after some discussion, a time was agreed upon. We don't know what that time is. However, um, in chapter 5 of Nehemiah, in chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, which is when he left, until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate of the governor's provision. So we know he was there at least 12 years. We don't know how long he was there. We don't know what they even agreed upon, what that time span was. But we know he was there at least 12 years. Uh, <laughs> so undoubtedly, uh, that time had been agreed upon. Now, so thus he made several appeals. They agreed upon a time, a length of time. Now keep in mind, Nehemiah had thought about this process extensively. So listen to what he's asking for. He asked for letters for safe passage and provision for his journey. Uh, he <laughs> These letters were necessary to prevent the governors who ruled over Persia um, west of the Euphrates River. Nehemiah needed cooperation from these governors in order to have safe passage through their ter territory. So he had to have these letters from the king saying, I'm on my way by the king's command. And that's what he requested. He also needed a large military escort. He needed protection from bandits and, and those along the roads. He needed to ensure that he would be safe. And Nehemiah even asked for an official letter to secure building materials from the king's forest. He needed timber. He needed uh, projects. He needed enough timber for the gates, the city walls, and his own personal residence. Because he was going to have to live while he was there. So he had to get timber. Can you, now listen, there weren't no, there weren't no sawmills operated by diesel or gas. There was nothing to plug anything to. So they had to go into the forest, cut their wood, and form their pillars and timbers out of this. Now, he wasn't going there for a month or two. He was going to have to be there for a while. This project wasn't going to be done in a couple of days. It would be a while. And so we know that whatever, it was, whatever time length was agreed upon, there was a lot of thought put into it. What time is it, Brother Curly? 743. Okay. 
yeah, we can get through this real quick. So what we must pay attention to is Nehemiah's strong testimony there in verse 8. Um, he says here, according to the good hand of my God upon me. This request that Nehemiah made was granted by the king because of God himself. God had moved upon the heart of the king. God had moved upon his mind. And God had granted Nehemiah provision to go back to Judah to help rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Um, the Lord's gracious hand was upon Nehemiah, so the Lord stirred the heart of the king to grant Nehemiah's request. Now, there are a couple, there are some things in here we, we're going to have to learn. Now, Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, he appeared to have a strong spirit and an even stronger trust in the Lord. He boldly went before the king because he trusted the Lord to guide and to help him. Yeah. Uh, and because of his trust, the Lord gave him his spirit of strong determination. And so it is with us. When we have a strong trust in the Lord and we're willing to be bold and righteous on the Lord's behalf, then we can trust that God will be with us. He'll give us that spirit of determination. There's some things that was said about me along, <laughs> family members and others that said about me along the way. And uh, I've never been one that was just so stubborn that I'm going to show you. That's just never been who I was when I was in when I was in college. I had a professor. I was in the education department. I was wanting to teach and coach. I started coaching um, ball my 11th, when I was in the 11th grade. I, I couldn't play that summer, so I just started coaching. I had my second knee surgery in May, and I knew I weren't going to be able to do much myself, so I just began coaching and fell in love with it. I fell in love with it the next year. My knees weren't strong enough to play that summer. So I was coaching again. So when I started college, I was still coaching. And I loved it. I found something that I thought I was really good at. I was a much better coach than I was a player. Uh, you don't have to be a big, strong person to, to be a coach. You need to be big and strong to play. But... I had a professor look at me one day and ask me, he said, uh, why are you wanting to teach? I said, because I want to coach. I'm in the P department. <laughs> I'm in the P department, but I'm taking an education class. And he asked me that question. I said, I want to coach. He said, well, you got no business in the education department. You got no business going to be a teacher if all you want to do is coach. Well, that's fine. I just left the education department. <laughs> You said I don't have no business here. I don't want to have to take classes under a man like you. Now, that's, that's how I viewed it. And, well, I miss coaching from time to time. Uh, I'm glad now I'm not doing it. But there were several years that I, I really missed it. But, hey, I didn't know I was going to be here. But it, what it cost me was me getting out of school and going to work in the heat. And in the cold, rather than going to work in the gym <laughs> and on a baseball field. And because I just didn't have that determination to show him. Now, my uncle, he was working full time and he was in school. He was in the chemistry department and he was told by one of his professors he would never, he would never fulfill his dream. He wanted to become a veterinarian. And his thoughts were, I'll show you. <laughs> he didn't even graduate college, but he got into vet school without, without having graduated. His scores, everything that he had done, his work in a veterinarian office was so, was so good that they accepted him before he got his degree. And he's been practicing since 88, 89. Uh, I... 
But when I come here, there's just something different when we're allowing God to use us. When I come here, this isn't something I can quit. When I leave here, it's because you and God are no longer in agreement for me to be here. Have there been times when I wanted to quit? Yes. When I've been, there's been times when I've been overwhelmed and just felt I just can't do this anymore? Yes. But my determination isn't about being here. My determination is being where God would have me to be. And that's why I'm still here. I could, I could have left 10 years ago when I thought that I'm way over my head with this. There's no, I don't know what I'm doing here. I could have left six months after I came. But it's, God, if this is where you would have me to be, this is where I'm going to be. And whatever it is I need to do, help me to do it. This is where Nehemiah was. And this is where we all are when we put it in God's hands and we're trusting him. He, just as he was with Nehemiah, he'll be with us. Two things we, we need to get, and I, I need to let y'all out. First, we can boldly approach God for help in times of need. We need to see this. We can boldly approach God in our times of need. But we can only approach him through Jesus Christ. We can't approach him any other way. We can't approach him on our own authority. It's in Christ alone who gives us access to God. But when we come to Christ and approach God through him, Christ gives us a right to be bold before God. And we can boldly make our requests known to him. He tells us in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. In Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, therefore, brethren, be bold, having boldness to enter the holiest of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which we consecrated for, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. His flesh was torn. It was beaten. It was battered. Uh, we have a high priest over the house of God. So let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. <sighs> from the evil conscience of our bodies washed with his pure water. And here's the other thing we need to, we get from this passage. If we will be bold in our work for the Lord, he'll guide us, he'll deliver us, and he will protect us. Through him, we have the power to be strong and courageous and fearless, even in, in times of difficulty. Deuteronomy tells us in 31 and 6, be strong and of good courage, do not fear, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Joshua 1 and 7 says, only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe and do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. What we'll find as we continue on is because Nehemiah trusted God in the midst of it all, he prospered. I'm convinced of this. If this church, in whatever decisions we make, if we trust God, God will be with us and God will prosper us. If whatever decision we make is sought before making them, we seek him and his will, and we follow his will, and we trust him. He will prosper us.